morning, everyone. Um, this is Mohammed Abu Nimr uh, with the CAICID, uh, International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue. I welcome everyone who joined us today with the webinar um, that uh, will focus on um, the role of religious agencies and actors in responding to humanitarian crises. And I think this is a, a theme that has been dealt with way before on many times. But I think it's in particular very relevant today um, for the, again, for what the globe and, and the entire um, uh, population of the world facing in the threat of the coronavirus uh, or COVID-19. Uh, but in general, um, the, the theme, as I said, has been addressed and also uh, um, relevant in many ways beyond the corona and also prior to the uh, corona. Um, we have um, we have a three we have about an hour an hour and, and maybe ten minutes uh, to to listen to three um, three cases three interesting uh, experiences and responding to the question how um, how their faith, uh, how their faith-based organization um, can, can really deal with or is dealing with um, um, both the situation right now as well as in general their experience with, um, with um, uh, humanitarian aid and FBO's work. Um, if if you allow me to, I, I guess I will start by introducing uh, the speakers that we have, and then give each one of them a chance to say um, their their words. Uh, the first, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Taras um, uh, Jibanski, and um, Dr. Taras Jibanski is as affiliated with the. Um, with the, uh, is from Ukraine with the Ukrainian Catholic University, and he te is teaching theology and interreligious dialogue. He's also director of the Institute of Religion and Society, and he's 2018 CAICED Fellow. Our second speaker uh, is uh, Ganja Nandini, the director of the project implementation. Communication for a Global Interfaith Wash Alliance from India. Um, the, 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 um, the base is in uh, Rishke, Rishikesh, uh, India, and um, on the river, in the banks of the National River of the Ganja River, um, uh, in the lab of the Himalaya, as she wanted to mention. She will also speak about her, um, her case. Our third speaker is uh, Thomas Horn who will actually prefer to prefer or want to present himself uh, and share his information with you. Uh, without, um, uh, without due delay or, or uh, further introduction, um, I will give the chance to um, Taras to say again in about, in about 10 minutes to say his uh, piece. And then I hope while he's speaking or talking, we can receive via chat uh, your your uh, your questions, your comment, and give people a chance to uh, interact as well. Taras, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Professor Bunemer. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening for everybody, because I think we are from all over the world here. And although we are quarantined, I do hope and pray that you and your families are all okay and not affected by the coronavirus. And so we can feel you know, stay still, thanks to technology, we can still be connected and still talk about such important issues as interreligious dialogue and the role of religion in today's world. In my presentation, I will be speaking mostly from a Christian perspective, because again, I'm a Christian, and this is the religion that I know best. I lived in it, you know, I lived through it, and I also studied Christianity for most of my life. I studied theology, so again, I'll be speaking mostly from a Christian perspective, but of course, no religion in the world exists in a vacuum uh, because uh, there is such a uh, thing as interreligious dialogue. And thanks to interreligious dialogue, we actually able to know to get to know each other and to work with each other. It also, uh, for my presentation, must be said that the religious teachings and the religious dogmas, the doctrines, they are actually the basis 
for humanitarian aid. Let me share my screen. I have a short uh, PowerPoint presentation, which I think will be uh, helpful. Uh, just a second. When I... Okay. Uh, I think it works. So, uh, interreligious dialogue and humanitarian action. As I've said, you know, for most of the humanitarian action, the religious teachings uh, and the doctrines and the sacred texts, they are the basis for this. And here I would like to give you a few examples from uh, religious traditions, just to show you how similar religious traditions are when it comes to considering the common humanity and helping your fellow human being. There is such a thing as a golden rule, and this golden rule text, we can find it in many different religious traditions. For example, in the Baha'i religion, uh, there is a saying that if your eyes be turned towards justice, choose for your neighbor that which you would choose for yourself. Buddhism, hurt not others in ways you yourself would find hurtful. In Christianity, in everything you do to others as you would have done, do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. In Confucianism, for example, do not do unto others what you don't want them do to you. Judaism, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the whole of the Torah, all the rest is commentary. And in Islam, not one of you is a believer until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. I think you can see a lot of similarities throughout the religions, how the brother or the fellow or the sister should be treated. In Christianity, one of the most striking things for myself, and I think for any Christian, is a saying that we find in the Gospel of John, where it says that if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. I think, again, this, uh, these passages are very, very important because uh, throughout history, you know, religious teachings and religious writings, they have been the basis for the action. And also, on the other hand, as you can see in the media, religion is often also misused, uh, misinterpreted. Uh, I would just also like to give you a few reasons why interreligious dialogue and uh, interaction among religions are so powerful. Now, first of all, religions are the sources of values, inspiration, and hope. And as you can see, as you can feel it in these dark times of the coronavirus, you know, hope and inspiration, these are the things that we really need throughout the whole world. Now, second, most religions emphasize the transcendence of humanity and the higher goals to which we are called to. So religions say that human beings are not just material beings, right? We are not just beings who need to eat and need a lot of toilet paper, but we are beings that have higher goals in our lives. Now, third, interreligious dialogue is a chance to create inclusive narratives, and also interreligious dialogue is an effective way to deal with humanitarian crisis, to resolve conflicts, and to build peace, because interreligious dialogue can engage people at the level of their deepest beliefs and uh, feelings. Uh, now let me concentrate on the rest of my talk on this fourth element of interreligious dialogue as a tool for uh, fighting humanitarian crisis. Now in 2012, I started to work at the city council uh, as a religious advisor to the mayor. And one of the things I, uh, I, I noticed that when the religious communities organize something, you know, other communities don't participate in this. So one of the things that I decided to, to do is to start a center for interfaith and interconfessional dialogue, because uh, from the beginning of the fall of communism, Ukraine has really enjoyed a lot of freedom, and especially religious communities, where they were flourishing. So I decided to have a center in which communities would get to know each other. And actually, in 2013, when we opened the center, we had a lot of religious leaders come together, and uh, this was the first time when they spoke to each other. So it was a very historic moment in, for Ukraine. Just a year later, in 2014, uh, there was a big change in the Ukrainian uh, society because uh, two things happened. The annexation of Crimea, so the humanitarian crisis started, and we have the armed conflict, the war in the east of the country. So again, what we noticed is that at the Libertas Center especially, that just getting to know each other with different religious communities was not enough. There was need for cooperation on collaboration. So uh, the religious community started to respond in different ways to the religious crisis. For example, when 
uh, when the conflict started in the center of the country, in the Kiev, in the Maidan Square, a lot of churches, they started to open uh, their doors as shelters. They were welcoming the people to come inside to get some rest and actually people were coming and the churches were being turned into hospitals. Uh, another thing that we uh, actually saw in this crisis is that people uh, from uh, different religions, uh, clergy, they started to be as mediators between the military and the people itself. So actually the, the religious leaders, they formed sort of walls endangering their lives and they became perfect examples and uh, they say that if the religious leaders would not have stepped down uh, in this crisis, there would be hundreds of thousands of uh, people uh, who were dead. But again, thanks to the intervention of religious authorities, this, the bloodshed was prevented. Another example that I would like to give you how religions responded to the crisis was, of course, when uh, the war began, uh, the, a lot of people lost their houses, they lost their jobs, and a lot of people from the east of the country, they moved to the west of Ukraine. Uh, so they were looking for jobs, they were looking for houses, and one of the things that Libertas Center for Interreligious Dialogue did was actually to bring together different companies from lower Ukraine and to start working uh, to use the interreligious dialogue as a tool to, to cope with the crisis, to create jobs, to create uh, different training opportunities. And uh, another thing which is seen in the times of crisis is that people uh, who are religious, uh, their religious identity might be a stake. For example, we have a lot of people from Crimea, the peninsula in the Black Sea, which was annexed by Russia. And uh, Crimea is mostly home to Crimean Tatars who follow uh, uh, Islam, Muslim religion. And a lot of uh, Crimean Tatars, they came to the west of Ukraine, which is mostly Christian. So for them, of course, there was a danger for their identity to start to be lost because, you know, they, they find themselves in a new environment, in a new milieu. Uh, they don't have mosques where to pray. They don't have their cultural centers. So there was a huge... Uh, uh, demand for a place for the Muslims to come together and to pray. And one of the things that we did uh, with the Christian leaders, we organized a, a roundtable discussion where people came together, they discussed the question of building the mosque in the city. And interestingly to see that a lot of Christian leaders were saying, uh, why not? Why don't they build the mosque if they need one? Uh, and the Muslims were saying, well, maybe uh, we should wait and, until Crimea returns back to Ukraine so we go back to our home. So this is a perfect example of how uh, the religious communities are responding to the crisis in the society. And thanks to this roundtable, actually, uh, some time afterwards, uh, Muslims were able to open their Islamic cultural center here in the West of Ukraine. Now, another big thing that happens during the war, during the humanitarian crisis, is that children are left without fathers and uh, women are left without their husbands. So we have a lot of orphans, we have a lot of widows. And one of the things that interreligious communities, interreligious uh, dialogue was organized for these communities was to bring together children and widows, their mothers, uh, to cope with the crisis. We went to the monastery and we organized a rehabilitation program uh, for these children and for the widows. And actually for the first time, for a lot of these women, this was the first time they were able to speak about their problems openly. Uh, and another thing that uh, that's very much needed in society in Ukraine and also all over the world is the fight against the fake news, the hate speech, and the propaganda in the media. So one of our uh, most successful probably projects was the project called the School of Interreligious Dialogue. And this was a project that uh, we organized throughout the whole year. Uh, what we did, we brought uh, representatives of religious communities from Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, and they trained each other of how to fight the fake news and the propaganda in the media. And actually, uh, this project received one of the prestigious awards from the Foreign Ministry of Austria two years ago. Another successful project that we started with interreligious community was the project uh, that brought together businesses, companies together to, find corrupt, to fight corruption together with the religious leaders. Because you know, when a politician speaks about corruption, probably people would not listen to him. But when the religious leader cites the scriptures, the Quran, the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, you know, people are going to listen to them better. Thank and you. Just, yeah, just to finish, just one, one more. One, one minute, uh, the religious communities in the times of crisis, 
today, uh, dealing with the coronavirus, a lot of monasteries and churches and uh, Islamic centers that turned you know, to sew the masks, to prepare the antiseptics, and also to give food to the elderly people uh, who need them the most. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Taras, for your uh, both uh, um, um, description of the center work, as well as the comments you made on the role that you played in during the, uh, the war. Um, I'm taking away from you that, which I think I'm sure the others will agree, uh, to work on relief and provide uh, assistance for people in stress is not strange for any faith. All faith encourage that, and I hope we theologically you cover that from the various Abrahamic and also hopefully non-Abrahamic tradition. Uh, um, maybe maybe later on, and then you talked about dialogue and the the, the forum that you uh, you created the prior to 1914, and also sorry, um, particularly after 1914, the crisis. Maybe later on you can relate to the to the more detailed question about how. How did you do the work when you provided relief and, and the type of services to the, um, during the crisis? What type of guidelines did, did, you, did you do as a Catholic institute that working with non-Catholic if you did that? But thank you. Maybe we can also go to the, um, to the next speaker, Ganja. The floor is yours. You have about 10 minutes. Go ahead. Kanja? Okay. All right, if we lost her, sorry guys, having some, having some technical difficulty. No problem, take your time. We can move to Thomas Horn. Thomas, you wanna, are you ready to share your comments? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Can you please just introduce yourself as well and then you have 10 minutes to share your input. Go ahead. Yes, hi everyone. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Tomas Horn. I'm from Budapest, Hungary, Eastern or Middle Europe. Uh, it's up to you, where are we? And um, I think I'm a bit out of this circle because uh, I'm a Jewish person. And my project mainly supports the Roma communities in Hungary, but the religious part, it's not a relevant thing in our work. Basically, we just want to help in poor people. But uh, anyway, thank you for being here. And I'm really happy that I can, I can be here. So let me talk about my uh, organization. Its name is Charity Taxi Foundation. And uh, I will give you a PowerPoint, just a general PowerPoint about my project. Uh, let me, let me um, share. Do you see now? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, quickly about Charity Taxi. Um, I don't know how much you are aware of the fact that uh, in 2015, we had the huge refugee crisis in Budapest. People from the Middle East started to come to Budapest. We were a transfer country, but a huge amount of people appeared in Hungary. So people started to cooperate and people started to help in some way, but we realized that it's not coordinated well enough. So we realize there is some kind of sensibility from the society. People wants to help, but it wasn't very well coordinated. So what was the first thing that people wanted to help? Everybody had something, some surplus in their households, you know, toys, clothes, food. Everybody has something in, I'm, I'm sure you have something which you could give to people in need anytime. So what we see, that was a huge amount of surplus in the households, but in the meantime, there's a huge, huge lack in the countryside. So refugee crisis was just a catalyzator for us, just a big event to show us the huge inequalities in the Hungarian society. 
So our basic idea of charity taxi was to be a bridge and connect surplus and need. It sounds very simple because it is very simple. It's just a simple idea. Let's be a bridge and connect people's need. Why we are different from other charity organization that we are not just collecting needs, we also collecting people. And I will uh, explain you what does it mean exactly. Uh, charity Taxi has five strategic goals we want to reflect. First of all, we want to pick up people surplus from their households personally. We go there personally, if you call us, and we help to get rid of your stuff. We also want to improve the donation culture of Hungary because people happy to help, but they don't know how to help. They don't have the car, they don't have time, they don't know the information, where, where to take it. They don't know organizations or they don't trust them. Unfortunately, in Hungary, the trust level is very low. So even if they want to help, they don't trust. And uh, that's a big problem. The third problem we want to reflect, of course, the poverty. People are deprived of basic needs in the countryside. The 30% 30, 30 of the society lives in small villages in poverty. We want to support them. The four strategic goals is the prejudice, the lack of understanding. Uh, people, people think they are very clever and they know everything, but we experience their lack of experience. They don't know, uh, until they don't know the people they want to support, they have many, many stereotypes. So our goal is to take these people who wants to give something, to take them to the supported communities, to meet each other, to talk each other, to have some fun. And this is the way how we break stereotypes. And the last uh, problem we're trying to reflect is the social responsibility. My personal goal with this whole thing is to promote social responsibility, to tell people to be active, to be in community and be something useful because it's fun and it's also useful. It's very good if you give something to people in need, but go there and uh, give it yourself, not just call someone who take it, go there and have a nice conversation with them. So this is what we do. Um, our main activity contains three elements. First of all, when we collect the goods from people's home, people can register if they have something to give, clothes, toys, small machines or something and we go there directly uh, the second part the preparation when we categorize and select all the donations in their warehouse we research the supported community in the countryside we mostly go to tiny tiny villages with two three five hundred people inhabitants and uh, we also take with us volunteer teams. And this is a very important part of our work. We're not just giving the, the charity to people in need, we take them groups. So people from Budapest can meet with these people and actually there are community days. The charity is just the focus of the day, but it's not the, the most relevant. It's just a tool how we connect people. Yeah, and the third main part is the donation trips, the community days. There's a charity market. There is a nice chat with the local partners we work with. So volunteers can get a picture about these villages. What is poverty? What does it feel like to live in these tiny, tiny villages? Uh, you know, about failures and successes. So we have a nice conversation. We also have local children programs and we also visit some families because it might be sensitive but the best and the most useful way to sensitize people and to break the taboos and the stereotypes uh, yeah just a couple of numbers but these are not uh, these hey, thank you you have one more minute please one more minute okay so actually it doesn't matter it's just numbers so why charity tax is different because we promote social responsibility. We involve people, donors, volunteers, companies, other organizations, 
Jewish and other and the religious organizations, we take them to these community days. And uh, but also we provide a free service that we go directly to people's home so they can get rid of they don't need and we sensitize them. And it's a movement in Hungary and I think we are improving very well. And uh, yeah, I think Thank you. that's the main sentence that we connect people, not just the need. Thank you very much. I don't know if it was uh, clear or... <laughs> yes, yes, Horn. Thank, th thank you, Thomas Horn, for, um, for, the, um, for the presentation of your organization. And I'm not sure you said you don't belong here. I think you belong perfectly here. You spoke about the need to work with a different community from different faith. In this case, uh, people from the Middle East who come from different faith group and also being in the host country, uh, Hungary, which is majority, I think, Catholic as well, uh, and the, the, from different faith. More important, I think you mentioned the issue of the charity is only a tool to help people learn, it, learn and know about each other and the stereotype reduction, which is an important aspect. Uh, I think for our work on dialogue, dialogue is a mean to reduce and uh, prevent the stereotypes and deal with them. And I think that's in the core of the mission uh, of many dialogue organization. And I think you illustrated a practical way to deal with that. M maybe on the issue of your Jewish identity, you mentioned that a couple of times. M one question for you for later on, and you said we, we don't deal with religion, but I wanna, I wanna challenge you on that and ask you to see uh, how does your faith or the faith of or the organization, if this is a faith-based organization, how do you deal with that, with the perception of people of you and you perceive other people from other faith? Um, and we know that there have been many stereotypes and many prejudice against many of the Muslim refugees who ended up in Hungary. Uh, how, how does that all deal and affect your effort for humanitarian relief? Maybe we can come back to that question later on. Uh, we'll go to our third speaker, Ganja. Are you, are you with us? Yes, I am. All right, excellent. So, Ganja, you can go ahead and get your ten minutes. Sure. So, I'd like to get started with the presentation. Hold on, just a second, as I do screen sharing. And maybe a note for everyone who's with us, please feel free to send your questions to the chat so we can get them. Thank you. Wonderful. So I would like to present about the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and the work that we're doing to bring faith leaders together for improved water sanitation and hygiene. And <clears throat> I think um, just going through it very quickly, we realized the power of faith and faith leaders in really inspiring behavior change. And so when we founded the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance, we realized that countries like India, where almost 90% of people subscribe to a faith, had a faith leaders actually serve as a great um, agent of change. And so one of the things that we inspired faith leaders to do is in addition to the work that they do for peace, expanding our definition for peace to include access to water, sanitation, and hygiene, especially with these statistics by the United Nations that show that India will have half the water it needs by 2030 and that the world will have half the water it needs by 2040, access to wash is a very pivotal part of not just peace, but just our very existence. And so when we founded the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance in 2013, we were the first interfaith organization to work for water and sanitation hygiene. And one of the main premier programs that we have is the 3H program, which is health, hygiene, and harmony. What we realize is when you bring together faith leaders 
towards a common enemy like water and sanitation hygiene, which serves as a common denominator across space, we actually inevitably also facilitate dialogue, but also encourage action towards more dialogue and going deeper into each other's faiths, each other's faith traditions. And I had a video that I'd like to play. I'd like to see if it's possible to play this video from uh, Almera's side, because I think I'm going to have a little bit of an issue with the sound. Can, is it possible to play the video from uh, Almer's side? Global Interfaith Wash Alliance. Hello? Jiva, Wisconsin. Yes, well, we, we hear it. We see the video and it's okay. Under 2013, the vision Hello? became as the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance on Jiva was launched. We see the video. At UNICEF World Headquarters, under sponsorship of USAID and the Government of Netherlands, Jiva's message reverberated across India and around the world, bringing together hearts and hands for its noble cause. Countless leaders joined forces on the grand level. On the ground level, Jiva is spearheading constant change. Jiva added purpose to the piety of the Kum. It reached out to the masses with a call to action to cleanliness, health, and harmony. At the heart of its messaging were water protection and preservation, as well as women's empowerment and upliftment. In partnership with Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council, or WSSCC, UNICEF, and other organizations, Jiva organized the Summit of Grace. This brought leaders, women and men, united together to end taboos around menstruation and child marriage and led prominent personalities and masses of citizens to take a pledge against the social evil. Jiva has initiated the change in so many cities and states across India over the years. I must mention the contribution of Swami Chidananda Saraswati Ji. Without his contribution, this would not have been possible. For making Ganga Sagar Mela, Swamiji and his team of you know committed uh, uh, volunteers and saints was of innumerable help. I have seen this was health and hygiene, but I can see as we went along, it became a three edge program health hygiene and harmony. All the faith leaders now working together. And in the 21st century, if the, any music is needed, any mantra is needed, that is mantra and music of togetherness, oneness and allness. The impact of Jiwa has been phenomenal. And you know what's amazing? Jiva means life. 
And when we first founded the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and gave it the acronym GWA, we did so because we knew without clean water, without improved sanitation hygiene, without a protection and preservation of our planet, there is no life. It's also important to recognize that faith uh, can move mountains, it can do swachita in a very effective manner. And I think this interfaith alliance in particular, bringing all religions together, is extremely powerful. Ganja, are you still there? Yes, I am. Yeah, you wanna? You have two minutes to make your concluding remarks. Yes. Yeah. So, in addition to the ground level work that the video exhibited, there's a lot of work that we do on the ground level. In addition, in our education institutes, in our programs such as, hold on, I'm just gonna pull up screen share again so you can watch the rest of the PPT. Great. So just quickly in terms of the water sanitation work that we're doing in terms of behavior change, there's been a lot of work that we do in terms of when we inspire faith leaders, what do we do from there? And so these are just some of the ground level initiatives, such as the World Toilet College, the Women for Wash, the Wash on Wheels, and innovative ways in which faith leaders are being inspired to really be part of the change. There was a beautiful, another example that I would like to share in which we joined together with the largest Muslim organization in India, um, the Can everybody yeah. hear me? Sorry. No, we can't, we can't hear you. Maybe you do less uh, sharing of the video and just conclude in one minute because then you can put it on the chat and put the link for people to see it on their own. So the last example I wanted to give um, to conclude was just this work that we did for bringing together interfaith leaders for a beautiful yatra, a journey that we did along the northern india in which we brought together hindu and muslim faith leaders across 1000 madrasas masjids gurukuls gurudwaras railway stations for planting trees and for protecting the environment and inevitably a lot of beautiful interfaith work happened through that another great example is this work we're doing with this buddhist community in bringing together mass tree plantation along the banks of the river ganga and lastly, in terms of the work that is happening for sanitation, toilets and sanitation actually serve as a great icebreaker for dialogue. And what we realize is when you bring together faith leaders for toilets, for sanitation, we get closer and we build dialogue and then we find other ways and other avenues in which we can work together. So that's all I'd like to share. And if anybody has any other questions or would like to see the videos that I wasn't able to share, I'm happy to send links. Thank you. Thank you, Ganga. Thank you for emphasizing as well the role of uh, the interfaith collaboration and the background on the WASH Alliance. Um, I, know, I know the project and I know your work as well. It's really inspiring to see your dedication to the both environment as well as supplying water and sanitation to many people who are in need and in, in, in many ways a classic humanitarian relief work as well um, can, can can be describing the work that you do thank you the three of you for sharing your cases um, i mean def definitely the case that 
relief and the humanitarian aid are not strange for religion. I think you all established that. You give, we have a Catholic, we have a, at least a Jewish program officer or program director who also worked with that. And we had an example from a Hindu uh, a context or background as well. However, the three of you serve all parts of communities, uh, regardless of their faith or, or ethnicity. Um, uh, maybe, maybe what we receive, we receive several questions. One common question is, how do each one of you in your own project deal with the COVID-19 reality? Whether wash, washing hands, using water, uh, social distancing, how is it affecting you at this point? I'll give Taras to start with, and then we'll move with Thomas and then Ganja. Uh, please, in one minute, how is, are you dealing? How is it affecting your work? How you're adjusting? Go ahead. My, yeah, my, my work is mostly teaching at the at the university. So of course, all of the classes are now suspended. There is no classes in person, but all of the classes have been moved online onto Zoom. So we do uh, the Zoom meetings and there are no services. There are no liturgical services. There are no masses, but people are encouraged because in most of the churches we have the cameras. So people are able to follow the liturgical services like masses online. So they don't feel alienated. They don't feel home. And also there are groups of people volunteering who deliver food for elderly people or the sick people. So that's one of the things how we respond to the COVID crisis. Ma'am, just to follow up one, uh, Teres. So I, with the humanitarian aid and the relief your work, uh, there is the, uh, this a group that provide food and, and, and assistance to uh, people at risk. How you're dealing with it in terms of social distance? Do you have yeah. any idea? Yeah, the volunteers, of course, they wear masks, they wear protective, uh, the, the guns, and they sanitize their hands all the time. They're being tested. And actually, one of the things that we've seen uh, flourishing is the, uh, the people from the Islamic Cultural Center being very, very active in this part of Ukraine, which is Christian. So it gives a really good example to the Christians who are here. And I think interfaith cooperation really goes forward. Of course, there are, there are challenges because of the quarantine. If you really want to have, to have more than five people, you need to have a special permission. But we established good relations with the city council, so we are able to work with them as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Thomas. Yeah, so I'm working home office as well, uh, unfortunately. Um, we created, I'm very proud to say that we created uh, within a couple of days, a new project. Uh, we we uh, produce masks in a social entrepreneurship, uh, cooperating with, uh, with uh, people who can sue. So basically, Charity Taxi My Foundation collects private donations, money. We buy tax deal, we buy the materials, we give people the materials who can sue the masks, and we take the ready masks to people in the social system, in the healthcare system. So it's a big circle now. There are many mask producing initiative in Hungary, but I'm very proud that we create this project in like three days and it's working. We already collected like, uh, uh, excuse me just a moment. Uh, we already collected 5,000 euros within one week, which is a huge amount of money in Hungary. So yeah, so we are producing masks. So we changed our activity and uh, I'm trying to support our villages in the countryside. So for example, this weekend, I will personally take the masks to the social workers in our partner villages. Thank you, but you're saying mobility and, wo and, and movement is limited, therefore you cannot do that, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we are working home office, but there are a couple of volunteers who can move and uh, basically this whole campaign we are doing now, it's, it's, it's online, except the people who can sue the mosques with their hands. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Ganja, the floor is yours again. So, WASH has been ever more amplified with this coronavirus, especially with our hand washing with the access to clean water. So it's, it's been wonderful actually to use a lot of our messaging for hand washing um, to be shared during this time. 
Um, we're also providing a lot of online services that continue to allow people to stay calm, um, to really connect with their selves in this time and to use this time not as a time of depression and despair, but to actually connect with the divine. And so there's a lot of work that we're doing and to encourage dialogue between interfaith leaders is also something we're planning to provide on an online service. For the social distancing, where besides advocating that social distancing is so important at this time when the country is in complete lockdown, um, we are advising people to while maintaining distance, not have emotional distancing and human distancing. And this has been something that the Honorable Prime Minister of India has also emphasized, but through faith leaders, through faith traditions, we're encouraging people to tap into how they can be bridging that emotional and human gap. Ganja, thank you, for, thank you for that. Can you expand on this? This is an interesting point. Social physical distance, but not emotional distance. Can you say more about that? Give examples. So we have been encouraging people to spend time together in meditation, in prayer, in their faith traditions, however they pray together, but pray together with distance between themselves, but connect energetically to each other. We've also encouraged people to connect online because even though there's social distancing, social media has served as a great platform to communicate with each other. So we're finding innovative ways in which we can maintain physical distances, but connect energetically and also connect in innovative means through online platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Now, there was another question for you later on in terms of dealing with the North India in general. Do you have any reflection about the role of religious leader beyond the Wash Alliance on the, on the, in, in dealing with the situation? So at the moment, the coronavirus is the only situation that is of immediate need, but we are going to be working and we're using this time to really work on how do we encourage youth leaders so we have a talk that we're going to be doing on in this time online with 5,000 Hindu and Muslim youth uh, coming together online and we're going to use this time to encourage dialogue through this crisis how can we turn it from a bane to a boom so hopefully the work that we do in the It seemed that we lost Ganja. She was talking about the work that we do. But uh, thank you again, uh, Ganja. I hope you can join us later. Let me uh, pose uh, um, another question about uh, for, the, for our panelists on uh, um, uh, on on the challenge of dealing with the humanitarian faith, humanitarian work from faith-based organization, where the typical one is usually when a Muslim, a Christian, or a Jew, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu come to work with other faith group. How do you deal with the issues of biases, perceived biases, by the uh, by the beneficiary community, by the refugees or people who are and uh, suffered from the disaster that you know you're coming to them with your own faith with with your own national or ethnic or religious address with the uh, with the faith-based organization identity many of them I'm, I'm sure will will assume that you might be biased toward your own faith how do you handle that assumption or that perception what are the mechanisms that you have used in order to assure people that you are not using aid to promote your own faith or identity. Um, Taras. 
Yeah, I think this is a, an excellent question, and it's a big challenge also for interreligious dialogue. Because of course, religious identity, uh, when you enter into dialogue, there is always the, the question of your religious identity, and people ask, people are sometimes suspicious, are you selling your identity? Are you imposing your identity? And uh, we have to really make a distinction, especially with my team when we work in these issues. I always tell them, when you give somebody something material, make sure you're not proselytizing and you're not trying to impose any dogmas, any teachings. And uh, a, a good example, just recently what happened is that those uh, internal refugees that we have from Crimea, the Muslims that live here in the Western Ukraine, you know, they were themselves people who are beneficiaries of the humanitarian aids. And now the Catholics, the Christians see them doing the voluntary service, distributing the goods to other Christians. And for them, it's really an enriching experience. And they understand that, you know, they, they're Muslims, we are Christians, but we can work together, you know, to to to, to deal with this crisis. So it's uh, it's very important that you know there is a limit to my religious identity where I can actually uh, do the preaching with my deeds and not do the preaching all the time. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you for the input. I, um, so togetherness when you work together, uh, uh, join teams, people can perceive it uh, as more credible and assuring them as well. Are there other mechanisms, Thomas, that you have used to counter the suspicion that you are promoting a faith group during your work? Thank you. Well, as I told you before, I, um, being the Judaism and me being Jewish, it's not a relevant point in our work. People, when we go to the villages to support them, they don't know. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm happy to talk about it, but it's not relevant in, uh, in our work. Usually, we just emphasize we build bridges between people with different background but the background mostly so social economical background because they live in small villages in poverty and i live in the biggest city of hungary uh, so yeah, yeah. yes yes Th thomas uh, you don't you don't make it visible and you don't make a point of it but the question does the people you serve do the people you serve know about the identity of the organization uh not really because they just know it's a charity organization and people wants to help them that we don't have really time usually to talk about so deeply um but yeah, but uh, is, is that would you define the organization as faith-based organization no we usually define it uh jewish community uh, uh yeah, Jewish community organization. We have many Jewish volunteers yes. and supporters and Excellent. Jewish values, but we try to involve everyone in Hungary. Doesn't Excellent. Th thank you. So are you saying the principle for you is not to make it visible, not to talk about it, and to serve everyone all over the uh, country. Nevertheless, in the field of humanitarian aid, uh, usually we say it's important to uh, uncover the implicit. So maybe you can think about this later on and we can chat about it. If they don't speak about it, it doesn't mean they don't know. It doesn't mean they don't have a concern. The question, what are the things in a place one can do? And I think you mentioned some of them, actually not to make it visible, not to make it, not to make your religious identity in the center of the service. We never hiding it, but it's not relevant. For example, in the media, we don't talk about it because it's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ganja, we're back, we're back to you. Are you online? Yes, thankfully. Excellent. So, thank you. We'll come back. The question was, how, how do you deal with the uh, identity of the organization when you go to provide the humanitarian aid in COVID situation or beyond that? How do you deal with working with Muslim when you're a Hindu-based uh, uh, organization, if at all? Go ahead. I think uh, for our particular organization, because it is founded by His Holiness Pujit Swami Kedanam Sarasasiji, who has decades of work for interfaith, with interfaith leaders, his reputation is something that we don't actually have a lot of issues with communicating with interfaith leaders or faith leaders of different faith traditions. Um, the other thing that I've seen him do on large platforms to bridge the gap is to use language. 
So he'll use language that is, like for example, if he's addressing a Muslim um, crowd and a Muslim organization, he'll be addressing it in a way in which it uses Urdu language and Urdu phrases to bridge the gap. So I think that is another way that we've been able to bridge the gap. We've also not been, a lot of the work that we do, one of the statements that I wasn't able to play in the video was a statement of a Muslim faith leader who said, you know, when I told Puja Samaji that we can't worship together, we can't step into places of worship together, whether it's his place of worship or my place of worship, Puja Samaji said that if we can't worship together, we can work together. And I think that's the important part of it is that we might understand that we have our differences in our way of worship, but that when we work together for the environment, for water, that that is our common humanity and that also helps us bridge the difference. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so far, four suggestions. Not to make invisible your faith-based religious identity, mm -hmm. serve all people without focusing on one group, and also use the terminology of commonalities and togetherness, focusing on the task as well. Um, we are, uh, we're, we maybe have a few more minutes. I'll give each one of you one minute to try and make a closing remarks for this conversation. Taras? Yeah, I, I would like just to say that, you know, an interreligious dialogue uh, for well, personally, when I come from the academic background, I always seen that there is this push uh, towards doing not just, you know, preaching or studying, but if your faith is just being taught in the books or studied, you know, it has real effect on your life and on your personality. So I would really encourage everybody to practice what is being taught and what is being preached. Thank you. Thomas? I just want to close with a different aspect. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Hungary, but actually the parliament is voting about a law today, which can give 100% uh, uh, power to the, to the government, which is a very, very risky, dangerous thing for, uh, about our democracy. So we are really uh, scared. We are really worried about our democracy. And I'm really proud of the society because there are many, many, many good social service initiative and uh, people are really the social responsibility which my organization is fighting for social responsibility is going really high in the hungarian society now people really wants to help and give give their effort and it's really good to see and uh, yeah thank you for being here thank you and good luck with your with your struggle to, to protect your democratic system Ganja. So I will just close with saying that thank you so much everyone for joining us. Stay safe during this time. I also would love to emphasize the importance for us even in interreligious dialogue and work we do with interfaith leaders to focus on our common humanity. Um, I think that when we work together for water and sanitation hygiene, when we work together for environment, and today also with this coronavirus, we're beginning to see that the borders and the boundaries of our countries, of our social identities, have become very, very gray. And this is the opportunity for us to see ourselves beyond, not, not to negate it, but to embrace it and to know that the common humanity and our human collective consciousness actually serves as a greater combining force for us now more than ever. And this has become a great agent for us as faith today to be able to use faith to stay strong and grounded even during these times of great challenge and great crisis. So I just request everyone to stay safe, stay home, and use their faith and their interreligious dialogue to stay grounded. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Ganja. Thank you. This really captured the spirit of the conversation and the, the need for both a human connectedness and common humanity to, to counter and deal with all the challenges that we're, we're facing. And in addition, 
we all were talking about the need for uh, religious and cultural literacy skills with people that we try to help them also to deal with our biases and uh, um, become more aware of our own biases when we do aid for faith, as well as to understand the situation and the context in which we operate. Uh, and having dialogue and communication is really necessary for any humanitarian aid to be effective and to be perceived. These are five or so points that we can take, uh, take away from this discussion. Thank you everybody for joining us and uh, I'm sure Anya will send another note for another webinar. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Yeah, goodbye. Thanks so much. Goodbye. And stay, stay socially distanced but emotionally connected.